All right. Um, well, we are really excited to have you here with us today, Dr. Gale, um, and so is the Concord community. We've invited the whole community to come out and um, hear you talk to us and to this class. Um, but first, I'm going to start out by doing a small introduction um, uh, for this class and myself. Um, my name is Jacob Snuffer. I'm the president of Phi Sigma Alpha, which is um, the political science honor society here at Concord University. Um, this is Ali Sears. She is the vice president of Pi Sigma Alpha. And uh, the rest of the people here at this table are a part of the community-based research class that our political science um, department is offering here at Concord. Um, so once again, we really appreciate you taking the time. So we wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction um, for the rest of the community. So will William Gale is an RJ and Francis Miller Chair in the Federal Economic Policy and is a Senior Fellow in the Economic Studies Program at the Brookings Institution. His research focuses on tax policy, physical policy, pensions, and saving behavior. He is a co-director of the Tax Policy Center, a joint venture of the Brookings Institution and the Urban Institute. He is also the director of the Retirement Security Project. <clears throat> Dr. Gale is the author of Fiscal Therapy, Curing America's Debt, Addiction, and Investing in the Future. He is the co-editor of several other books in his area of expertise and has been published by several news journal outlets, including the American Economic Review, Journal of Political Economy, and Quarterly Journal of Economics. From 2006 to 2009, he served as Vice President of Brookings and the Director of Economic Studies Program. Prior to joining Brookings in 1992, he was an assistant professor in the Department of Economics at the University of California, Los Angeles, and a senior economist for the Council of Economic Advisors under President George H.W. Bush. So Dr. Gale attended Duke University in the London School of Economics and received his PhD from Stanford University in 1987. He lives in Fairfax, Virginia, is an avid tennis player, and he is married to Diane Lim and is the father of two grown children. So we really appreciate you um, and so does the Concord community for coming and speaking with us. So with that, let's all give Dr. Gale a small hand clap and we'll hand the floor over to him. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, I couldn't hear some of the last things you said, but uh, uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, so can we put the PowerPoints up on the screen? Yeah. Good. All right. You can see yourself there for a second. That's okay. Um, All right. So. I can no longer see you, but can, can you see the PowerPoints? Yes. All right, so uh, I'll probably talk for about 20, 30 minutes, and then uh, I know you all put together some some killer questions, actually, and uh, I will look forward to, to answering those. Uh, so I started writing this book called Fiscal Therapy, uh, uh, which is, by the way, a name that my, a title that my wife thought of. Uh, I, I was banging my head against the wall, and uh, uh, she came through with, the, with a good idea, and I was smart enough to, to go with that idea. Uh, but I started writing this book about the federal debt and the rising federal debt and the problems it would cause for society. And uh, when people talk dryly about the problems that it'll cause for society, they mean burdens that would be imposed on your generation. Uh, burdens in terms of either higher taxes or lower government spending uh, that, for reasons we can talk about, the baby boomers have largely escaped uh, paying for and uh, uh, future generations, including yourselves, uh, will face this increase. Uh, but then I got into the thinking about debt and how to change debt and deficits and all that. And I realized you, you can only do it through specific policies, through specific tax changes or spending policies. 
changes. So I ended up uh, spending much more time than I had originally expected focusing on the way we tax and the way we spend. And the story that comes out of those two issues is really simple. Long-term debt is rising and is a problem for the economy. At the same time, the way we tax and the way we spend are both problematic. Uh, so it turns out solving two problems is easier than solving one. And that is uh, what the book tries to do, is propose a set of tax and spending changes that simultaneously improve the way we tax and spend, uh, but also get the debt under control. So as I know here, the three-part solution, uh, uh, one part is controlling spending, is entitlements, meaning Social Security and Medicare. Uh, second part is boosting investment in uh, children's programs uh, and infrastructure. And then the third part is uh, raising taxes, uh, particularly on high income or high wealth households. Okay, so, uh, that's where we're going, uh, but let's start at the beginning with uh, debt to GDP, uh, the history of, of uh, uh, this is all of U.S. fiscal history tied up into one graph. Uh, and it's basically a pretty simple story. Uh, until 1980, we only had increases in debt uh, uh, during wars or recessions. And you can see the peaks of the Civil War, World War I, World War II, uh, various bumps for, uh, for some of the recessions in there. Uh, then Ronald Reagan came into office in 1981 and cut taxes and boosted the military spending at the same time. So debt started rising during peacetime prosperity for the first time uh, in our history. Uh, lawmakers really didn't like that. They came together in the late 80s, early 90s, and bipartisan agreements uh, to control the debt. And the debt came back down, and you can see it, it kind of bottoms out around 2000. Uh, then in 2001, uh, Alan Greenspan, the Federal Reserve Chair, testified in Congress that we were going to run out of debt uh, if uh, Congress did not cut taxes. Uh, running out of debt seems like uh, uh, quite an anachronistic uh, issue. It would be an understatement to say that we solved that problem. Uh, we will never face that, that problem again. Uh, and then, so Congress, once they get permission from a leading person to cut taxes, they cut taxes, they raise spending, uh, then the Great Recession hit, and uh, the economy, the bottom of the economy, so the deficit went up more. And then, of course, the last couple of years, we've had more tax cuts and more spending increases. So ever since we thought we were going to run out of debt in 2001, uh, we've been increasing debt and increasing debt. Uh, and that's where we've been. Where we're going is in this graph. And um, uh, I titled this, this time is different. Uh, it's different in two different ways from the past. The obvious way is that debt is, is, is forecasting to rise uh, to levels that we've never seen in the past. Uh, the other way that is different is that this is not a temporary spike. Uh, there's no war that's going to end. There's no recession that's going to end that's going to turn this line around. Uh, it's basically uh, now baked into the cake uh, that debt and deficits are going to continue to rise, uh, even with the economy strong and uh, even with interest rates low, uh, both of which are normally good for deficits, good to control deficits, but um, uh, are not enough because of the basically the imbalance that we have between taxes and spending right now. So if you ask what's going on to cause that, um, it's basically that we're, again, the story is pretty simple. We're spending more, we're projected to spend more on healthcare and social security and net interest than we did in the past. Uh, social, uh, social security is going up there, the boomers are retiring. You can see it kind of levels out once, once the youngest boomer uh, reaches full retirement age. Uh, healthcare spending is rising because there will be more old people and healthcare for old people is much more expensive than healthcare for young people. Uh, and because health tends to rise faster than the rate of inflation. 
I'll cause standardized batch for the rate of inflation, so that will cause a continual boost. And then the net interest line, the dash line, is rising uh, dramatically over time. And that's because we pay interest on the debt, and the debt is rising, and the interest rate that the government will face is projected to rise over time. So more than 100% of the increase in spending over time uh, is focused on healthcare, social security, and net interest, the basic forecast. Everything else is projected to decline as a share of GDP. Now everything else is the things that we think uh, uh, are one function of government. So when it says non-defense discretionary spending, it's called slightly. That's basically government investment uh, in infrastructure, in uh, uh, energy safety technologies, uh, education programs, uh, National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health. Uh, on health. So it's basically government investment is following, and then when it says other mandatory, that means other than Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid. And so it's basically the safety net. So the two things that are falling over time are government investment and the safety net, and the things that are rising over the time are transfers to the elderly. And that is the basic imbalance that we need to switch. Uh, and the proposals of the book basically bring the top two lines down, bring the, the, bottom, uh, the bottom two lines for safety net and investment up. And that, that in one picture, that's the, that's the basic spending report. So, so far, all we've done is look at uh, forecasts of what's going to happen. Uh, and the issue is, you know, who cares? Why does it matter? Uh, that debt is rising, why does it matter that uh, government investment is going down or the safety net is being weakened? And uh, this actually requires a little nuance uh, as we move to the economics of the situation. Uh, not all debt is bad. Uh, we've got good reasons for uh, uh, using debt to finance investment, just like a household might take out a mortgage to buy a house. Uh, it makes sense to, to do that. Uh, we might use debt to fight a recession, so if the government cuts taxes in a recession, uh, that'll uh, boost spending, but at the same time, it'll reduce debt. But that's a, that seems like an acceptable use um, of debt. Uh, but that's not what's happening in the forecast. Uh, as I indicated in the earlier graph, what's happening is increasing deficits are being used to pay uh, increasing uh, transfers to the elderly. So there are good reasons to accumulate debt, but those are not the reasons that we are actually projected to accumulate debt. So again, there's a link between the level of debt and what we're doing with the money, the way we tax and the way, the way we spend. Um, so if you remember your freshman English, uh, uh, in heavy ways, sun also rises. One character asks the other, how did you go bankrupt? The other says two ways, gradually and then suddenly. And uh, I, I remember that as a, I always thought that was a notable uh, uh, way to describe things. And it wasn't until I studied fiscal policy that I realized how applicable uh, that could be. So let's start with the suddenly part because I want to I want to take this off the table. You hear a lot of people say that uh, we're, we're going to face a financial crisis because of the debt. Uh, I do not think that that's the case. Um, the U.S. is the world's reserve currency, the dollar is the reserve currency. Uh, we borrow our own currency, so we'll never be in a situation that, say, you know, Argentina is in, uh, where they, they uh, borrow in dollars and so uh, if their economy weakens, uh, they still have to pay back in dollars. Uh, and we can pay our debts for decades. The, I showed you that graph that with debt rising inexorably. Um, uh, that's not good, but we certainly have the resources to, to pay the interest on that debt uh, if we choose to, to go that route. So um, I don't think there's an economic case that U.S. public debt is going to cause a financial uh, meltdown. Uh, but I want to be clear, policymakers could create a financial meltdown. Uh, for example, by not increasing the debt limit, 
uh, when that comes around. The debt limit uh, puts a lid on how much borrowing the government can do. And uh, periodically, the lawmakers have to increase that level uh, or suspending. And uh, you get some political games of chicken going on that, that could cause uh, a crisis if, if they handle it poorly. But the main point about the crisis is even if there's not a crisis, there's still a problem. It's just a grand one. It's not the big, splashy, headline grabbing financial crisis. It's a much, uh, much uh, less exciting, but equally devastating, uh, gradual scenario. So um, my colleague Charlie Schultz, my former colleague Charlie Schultz, once wrote that deficits are determined to the woodwork, not the wolf of the door. And what he meant by that was precisely this gradual scenario I'm talking about. Uh, what happens is when the government borrows money, uh, it's, uh, uh, instead of they cut taxes by a dollar, so uh, government borrowing goes up, uh, borrowing, of course, is negative. They're saving, so government saving goes down by a dollar. Let's say households save some of that, say 20 cents, but they spend the rest. Uh, so national saving would fall by 80 cents. That's a combination of saving by the private sector and saving by the public sector. So national saving goes down uh, with higher deficits. Once that happens, once we know national saving falls, then we know the future national income will fall. Uh, in the same way that if you save less now, or your parents save less now, you and your parents will have less income in the future. Uh, the same thing is true of the country. Uh, once the national savings goes down, future national aid will come down as well. Now there's an issue about how that will happen. It could happen through higher interest rates. That would government borrowing could raise interest rates. It, that would crowd out investment and reduce future output. Uh, but right now, if you're paying attention, you know that interest rates are, are low. So it doesn't look like the crowding out of investment is happening. Instead, what's happening is we're borrowing more from overseas. Uh, and uh, in that case, our output will fall, but the claims that foreigners have on our output will increase. So what's left for us after we pay back foreigners will go down. Either way, uh, the key point is once national savings falls, future national income will fall. Uh, there's a lot of evidence on this. I don't have time to go through it, uh, but uh, there's uh, dozens of papers that, that corroborate uh, various aspects of this uh, story. So that's the problem. Uh, I don't have it on the slide, but we're talking about the debt scenario reducing the future level of output by between 5 and 10 percent, uh, which is a big change. Uh, the tax cut in 2017, for example, uh, is only supposed to raise the economy, the size of the economy, by one tenth of one percent. Uh, over 10 years. So this gradual 30 year, five to 10% decline uh, is a really significant uh, decline. Uh, median income, for example, is about 60,000 per family. So now we're talking about a $6,000 reduction in the median family's uh, uh, income. All right, so we saw the graphs to explain why it's a problem. What do we do about it? Uh, we have to change the debt to GDP trajectory. Uh, I will, there are lots of, there's, we could spend an hour on this slide. Uh, let me just mention, I ended up focusing on a target ratio uh, of 60% uh, GDP. And uh, in order to achieve that target, uh, if we started in 2021, and we wanted to get to a 2049 debt to GDP rate of 60%, we would need to adjust spending of taxes by 4.4% of GDP. Uh, that's an enormous number. Uh, it doesn't look big because it's 4.4% of a very big number, which is GDP. But it, it turns into something like $900 billion a year. Uh, so several times bigger than the tax cut we had a few years ago. And uh, of course, we're talking tax increases here, uh, not tax cuts. Uh, so uh, if we instead went for a target of 100% of GDP, we would 
still need two more acres at HEB. Again, that's very big. That's, uh, that's sort of like uh, half of the entire Social Security payroll tax, or it's practically the entire defense budget in terms of in terms of the size. And of course, if we wait, then uh, the, the required adjustments get bigger, not smaller. So when people see those numbers, they start getting squirmy and looking around for uh, uh, easy solutions. Uh, I'm going to skip the slide except to tell you that there are no easy solutions. Uh, there's no substitute for cutting spending or raising taxes. Um, and what I do in the second half of the book is go through a whole series of proposals. I'm just going to mention them very briefly here because most of your questions uh, have to do with the proposals, so we can pick up the issues uh, in the in the in the Q and A. Um, but in terms of healthcare, uh, let me just highlight: we need to expand coverage. Uh, I'm going to go with the public option. Uh, that's something, for example, that Pete Buttigieg is proposing. Uh, and I go with Medicare for all, uh, but we can talk about that. Um, and then we need to control costs very importantly to get that, that spending one down. I feel like the easiest way to do this is to let Medicare negotiate the prices of the drugs that it buys. Right now, Medicare uh, pays significantly more than Medicaid or VA for the Veterans Administration for the same drugs. And if they just paid the same amount, uh, we would save uh, half a trillion dollars over, over the next decade. Um, so that seems to me to be one of the obvious changes, and there are other obvious changes in healthcare as well. Social Security, I was part of a commission a couple of years ago that um, proposed various reforms, so I just adopted that commission plan here. Uh, it's basically an effort to raise retirement age to correspond to the rising uh, lifespan on average uh, of American households and uh, uh, raise payroll tax benefits, so payroll tax rates, sorry, to cover some of that, and then make the benefit structure more uh, progressive, boosting it for low-income households and reducing it for high-income households. Um, the second part, that is the previous slide was the control and entitlement part of the investing in the future. Uh, basically carved out an additional 1% of GDP to strengthen social policy and, and really investing in kids early in their life uh, uh, is, is one of the key ingredients here. Uh, and hatching current holes and the take up in, in the welfare system is another key issue. Only about 25% of people that are eligible for TANF or housing or energy subsidies actually receive them. Uh, so getting the programs to people who are already eligible to make a big difference. Uh, infrastructure, I just, you know, we, we need better and more infrastructure in the country. This is sort of a consensus goal. And we need more research and development. So there's money in the budget that I propose for that as well. And then there are taxes. Uh, there's no getting away from the fact that we need uh, higher revenues to deal with uh, not only the federal debt, but also the spending uh, priorities that, that I just mentioned. Uh, I feel like there's some obvious things to do here. Uh, one is to cut the cut cut tax. The second is a value-added tax. It's basically a national consumption tax. In both cases, there would be offsets for low-income households. Uh, there, then there are a variety of changes to business taxes and personal taxes, which I won't go into. But I want to mention this last bullet about increasing IRS funding and enforcement. Uh, there is a massive amount of tax evasion in the country. One out of every six dollars that's owed in taxes is not paid, uh, basically because people don't report the money to the government, and the government uh, doesn't know how to collect this. If you're wondering how they get a statistic like that, uh, they do some very intensive audits of randomized sections of the population to, to find out what people are doing and what they should do. But I, I didn't emphasize this much in the book, 
that we did the need to raise money in enforcement. But since the book was done, I've come to appreciate more than ever that we need uh, we need to enforce the tax system better. If we could cut emission in half, we could raise uh, uh, you know two trillion dollars over a decade. So uh, that should be focused on. All right. So if you did these proposals, what would happen? Uh, uh, this shows the total spending, non spending revenues, and the deficit under the current forecast. Uh, under my proposal, non-interest spending would be about the same in the long run uh, because the health care and social security would be cut, and safety net and government investment would, would increase. Uh, but my total spending would come way down. Uh, from the forecast, and the reason is that net interest spending would fall. And the reason that interest spending would fall is because there's significant tax revenue uh, increases. And it's sort of like if you've got a credit card debt and the balance is growing, uh, you can restrict your spending, but the only way to knock off the interest payments is to start paying the debt down. And that, that's basically what the increase in revenue tries to do here is like be proactive and get the debt down to begin with. And then you can see we save, we save a substantial amount of money uh, in the long term uh, uh, if, we, if we get the interest rate down now. The, the, the deficit actually heads towards zero. It never quite gets to zero, but balanced budget is what's not my goal. It, it's not. Um, uh, it doesn't have much economic significance. What does have economic significance is the debt level, uh, and that comes down uh, under the proposal actually to 52 percent uh, instead of 60. This is what happens when you forecast 30 years in advance. Uh, it's basically rounding error. But if it turns out the proposals are better producing debt than I'm estimating them to be, uh, then we can cut back on some of the tax increases. Uh, and still get to 60, right? So what are the effects of this proposal, these seven proposals? Well, they would raise growth by, they would raise the size of the economy by about 7% uh, in 2050, according to the independent board and budget models. And this was an independent estimate, it's not an estimate I did. Uh, I mentioned the range of 5 to 10% earlier. Uh, they got 7% rather than more as they did not include the investment effects of infrastructure or R&D or investment in kids. They included the budget effects, so they got the higher costs, but they didn't get any of the benefits uh, that those programs would, would create. So I'm happy with the 7% number. That's a big gain over 30 years, uh, but I think the true number might actually be higher. Uh, this would reduce inequality and increase mobility. And uh, uh, the thing about the plan that's useful is that it's, it's, um, it's transparent. Everything is specified. Some budget reform may just have people saying, uh, you know, we'll figure out these cost savings later. Uh, I don't do that. I actually specify all the costs uh, involved. The other thing is, you'll notice there are no, there are no radical proposals in here. There's no universal basic income, there's no single payer health insurance, there's no wealth tax. Uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. One is I didn't want to get slogged down in side debates. Uh, but two is I wanted to show that we can get where we need to go with proposals that are already out there, uh, that, that have already been vetted, they've already been tried in some other countries and stuff like that. So uh, I don't object in principle to radical proposals, but I didn't put them in here. Um, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in this particular budget plan. And lastly, uh, the budget effects do not include the growth effects. So I'm not doing the common rules of saying, oh, this tax change will increase the economy so much because it, it'll pay for itself. Tax cuts don't pay for themselves, and, and I'm not assuming that, that they are. All right. Um, so there are other things to say, there are other, uh, but I think, um, let me just, let me just move uh, to the end here and take questions and maybe, maybe uh, go back to some slides in a bit. Uh, it's, there's a tendency to get depressed about all this. It seems like a huge problem and it seems like politics are dysfunctional, the political system is dysfunctional. 
So I want to try to end on the uh, positive note. Uh, one issue is that getting, getting the debt under control uh, should be both on the conservative and the liberal role. Uh, so there's hope in the future that they will unite at least in this regard. Conservatives don't want the government spending money it doesn't have. And uh, liberals want a proactive uh, government that, that, that requires resources. And so I feel like someday they'll both get it. Uh, right now they both don't get it. Uh, second point is there's much to be gained from enacting a plan like what I talked about. It would raise growth, it would reduce inequality, it would raise, uh, increase economic opportunity and mobility. That's what we're trying to do in so many policies across the board. And uh, uh, so the fact that there's some gain out there may help uh, may help political leaders uh, see the light. And then just as a general rule, it's clearly impossible now to engage in long-term fiscal reform in the political system, but that doesn't mean that it'll always be impossible. I mean, we've gone through debates in this country, uh, everything from, you know, civil war to women's voting rights to to civil rights to the current controversy to, you know, people, we, lots of times in the nation, we have kind of ugly, nasty arguments, but oftentimes in the past, we get past that and, and do the right thing. And that's that quote at the bottom of the page, which is attributed to Winston Churchill, uh, but he didn't have to say it. Uh, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've exhausted all their other options. So let me leave you with that as sort of an optimistic uh, way to sum up and uh, I look forward to talking with you and taking your questions. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to switch back so you can actually see me. All right, good. You guys are still there. That's great. <laughs> So from the list of questions that we sent you, were there any particular questions that you wanted to go ahead and tackle, or do you just want us to move on to our questions? Uh, you're a little muffled. Um, uh, Sorry. <laughs> I don't mind you ask questions. I hope I follow you. Yeah, yeah, use the microphone. Um, so, is it, yeah. um, I was asking if there were any particular questions from the list that we sent you that you wanted to go ahead and tackle. Uh, I don't have the list in front of me, you, so you should just add, they were good questions, I, I confess. Uh, but if you just, can just ask me, I can then talk about um, We're going to go to question number seven, so I'm going to pass the mic to the person who wrote the question. If it's green, it's on. Um, so I wrote the question, um, one of the Democratic presidential candidates is running on the idea of universal basic income. Uh, what are your thoughts about the ways in which he aspires to accomplish this, and how would that fit into your proposal discussed in the book if he was elected and implemented this plan? But this is a great question, and it's actually the question I get most often. Uh, uh, with a universal basic income, there's two key issues. Uh, how big is it going to be, and is it going to replace existing programs or supplement them? And uh, uh, I'm actually just finished a paper today that proposed a value-added tax uh, with combined with a universal basic income uh, to to offset the, the cost of the tax for for low income households, uh, but um, the basic income in my proposal would only be about twenty six hundred dollars per year uh, for uh, family four. So what Andrew Yang is proposing a thousand dollars a month per adult. So his proposal would be basically 10 times as large as mine. So it's sort of like a, 
The minimum wage debate, for example, the question of are you in favor of the minimum wage is not really the right question because the minimum wage of $5 is totally different from the minimum wage of $15. Uh, the same thing with the UBI. I, I propose it as a way to, to ensure that people that are poor don't have to pay the that amount of tax. Uh, but uh, uh, some people would propose more aggressive UBIs. Uh, and I just, I, I think that um, uh, it could reduce labor supply, it would be expensive. Uh, I don't think it would effectively eliminate other programs, I think uh, it would still be a demand for food stamps and so on. So uh, I just feel like the approach in the book where we expand and strengthen the safety net uh, would be more effective than the UBI. But frankly, given my goals, uh, uh, I would take a UBI over doing that. It's green, it's on. Oh. Um, so your book plays out a plan to properly address the issue of our increasing national debt, which implies there is still hope for our economy. At what point do you think that we are past the point of no return? Are you, I'm sorry, are you, are you, are you talking about the high tax rates that encounter could I think of the fix? Um, no, I said that your book lays out a plan to properly address the issue of our increasing national debt, which implies that there is still hope for our economy. At what point do you think that we are past the point of no return? Oh, in terms of debt accumulation, um, uh, we're nowhere near that. There's, that's sort of a question about the crisis. You know, is there some point where once we get a certain debt level, then it's guaranteed that we're going off the cliff? Um, I don't think we're anywhere near that. I, I think that is, uh, I mean, that is a common concern. Politicians on both sides of the aisle have talked in the past about uh, what they would euphemistically call a hard landing. Uh, and um, uh, I just don't see it happening. I'll give you an example. Uh, in 2008, um, we had a real financial uh, crisis in the country. And we actually exported that crisis to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world turned around and sent money to the United States because we were a safe place to invest. And so, so I don't see us going off the deep end uh, financially because of the public debt anytime soon. Uh, I, I feel much more like it's this gradual, insidious, uh, kind of invisible uh, effects that are, that are more dangerous precisely because all right, so we have another question um, from a student that wasn't able to make it today. His name is Seth. He asks, the mismanaging of funds concerning Social Security has led to circumstances where today's workers are paying for today's retirees instead of putting money towards their own as it was originally intended. You state that Social Security is slated to run out of funds as early as 2034. What are the most crucial steps in order to prevent this from happening, and do you think that my generation will live to see the benefits of this program being Social Security? Security. I've been having a very hard time here. You can read the questions. So the question was number uh, nine. Do you have the questions pulled up? I'm sorry, which question? Um, number nine. I can read it for you again if you'd like. I, 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 I got it. Okay, so uh, Social Security is it's not the mismanaging of funds in Social Security? Uh, yes, so do you believe that my generation will be able to see the benefits from the program Social Security? All right, so Social Security faces uh, a long term shortfall because of uh, uh, basically generational dynamics. The first, uh, the first generation received a lot of benefits but didn't put any taxes. And that has to come from somewhere. Where it comes from is the future generations. And so uh, uh, 
the shortfall in Social Security is due to that. It's not due to any mismanagement of funds. Social Security, they just take the surplus and stick it in the Treasury. Uh, uh, so I mean, it's not it's not malfeasance that led that feed to the Social Security balance. It's just uh, uh, the the inevitable effect of subsidizing the first generation uh, and making future generations have to pay for it. Should I just go through these other questions? Uh so we have other students uh, that can ask you the questions. There were some that we were wanting to make sure that we asked in case we don't have time for all of them. Um, and so we might be going out of order a little bit if that's okay with you. We can state the number, that way you can uh, look at it while, we're, while you're answering. Did you catch that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah that's good. My trusty assistant here. I don't know what to do. I can make that yeah. there. Uh, I, I couldn't hear what you're saying. If, if you want to just give me the question number, I will, I will read it. Question eight. Eight. Okay. That's what I'm going to There you go. Oh, okay, so why, why did U.S. spending on tax practices differ so much from the rest of the G7? That is a great question. Um, uh, I, I don't know for sure what the answer is, but it's, it seems to be like different, different cultural expectations uh, in Europe. You know, childcare is free and education is free and healthcare is free, but they're paying substantially more in taxes than, than we do almost a third of the world. Um, uh, but remarkably, the growth rate in Europe and the U.S. is about the same. So it suggests that you know either system can generate uh, growth rates in the same uh, in the same approximate level. But uh, I think it's just a combination of history and, and culture that uh, has has led us and the G7 to be to be so different. All right, that's your question, Richard. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Gale. Question one. Oops. Sorry, what number was that? Question one. 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 Okay. Good. The government has benefited from historically low interest rates. The interest rates were higher. Would automakers be less willing to borrow more money? Uh, another great question. Yes. But if interest rates were higher, they would be less willing. Uh, there, when you think about what it is that will get policymakers to do something, uh, you can think of either a crisis or social security money on the money in 2034, or uh, if interest rates rise. Because if, if interest rates rise, uh, net interest payments go up. And politicians hate net interest payments, both Democrats and Republicans. And when there were these uh, bipartisan solutions, uh, in the late 80s and, and early 90s, uh, it, it was spurred by the fact that interest rate, interest payments were at an all-time high. So if interest rates go up, I think that's one of the few things that would get policymakers' attention and get them to do something on this. Question six, please. Six. All right, sorry, I don't hear you. Do you believe increased spending on infrastructure is necessary not to get infrastructure compared to the other G7 countries? So let me tell you, let me start by telling you one little anecdote about infrastructure. Uh, in the course of writing this book, I learned that in 20 cities around the United States, Domino's Pizza has donated money to the local government so that they would be able to potholes so that the drivers could deliver pizza to your doorstep more effectively. Um, that to me is a sign of uh, that we need more infrastructure and the governments are not uh, offering it or are not providing it. So yes, I think it's necessary. And one of the interesting things about infrastructure is that most boring things are the most productive investments. So for example, everyone wants to you know, cut the ribbon on a new airport or something like that. But uh, the, the investments that have the biggest benefits are things like paving potholes 
in uh, maintaining uh, rent quality and stuff like that, which are not really uh, uh, news moments for a, uh, a politician, but actually the economy works much more effectively. Um, our infrastructure is clearly worse than the G7 countries. I don't know if you've been overseas recently, but if you go uh, to like the, uh, the Paris Metro and compare it to the New York subway, uh, you know, we lose uh, dramatically. There, if you look at airports in Germany compared to JFK uh, or you know, or Dallas, uh, you know, we're, we're just not in the same category. We've been to Los Angeles, we've gone to LAX recently. I mean, this is a disaster. It's like one of the biggest countries, one of the biggest cities in the world, and the airport is, is, is just totally dysfunctional. So there is an enormous amount that we can improve on infrastructure uh, uh, to get up to the quality both that we need and that other countries have. Question four. Ford? Yes. People supported President Trump's tax cuts, but then when given the facts, their answer changed. Uh, why do you think that happened? I'm not quite sure what. Can you elaborate on this question? In your introduction, you talked about how whenever people were in support of the tax cut, but then whenever they were given more information about the effects of the tax cut, they changed their minds. Oh, oh, I know. Okay, so this has to do with polling and framing. And uh, if you ask people, for example, do you want a tax cut? And you say, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, if you ask them, if you want a tax cut, if the government also cuts spending on, say, Social Security or health care or education or the environment, uh, people will say no. And uh, there's a couple of issues going on. One is people don't think about tax cuts in the context of the budget. They just think about whether you're going to tax cut or not. But then when you frame it in terms of spending, the spending that would have to go down uh, to finance the tax cuts, people actually like the benefits uh, more than they mind paying the taxes. So uh, this is sort of a plea on my part to get people to focus on the tax and the spending side of, this, of a situation rather than just to focus on, on tax cuts. What, what the political process tends to do is talk about tax cuts independent of spending uh, priorities and then talk about spending priorities independent of the taxes needed uh, to finance those uh, those items. So uh, when people think about these things together, yeah, jointly at the same time, they come to different conclusions than when we think about them separately. That to me, by the way, suggests that there is room for a political leader to frame the issues appropriately uh, and get people uh, behind the notion of fiscal reform. In fact, I'm going to add that to one of my, uh, uh, my reasons for optimism at the end. All right, question number three. Three. Oh, this is a great question. Uh, you don't write much about prisons in your chapters about creating a more productive society and benefiting the economy as a whole. Have you given the issue of education, particularly education targeted to the incarcerated population, much thought? Um, I, I totally agree that the book short changes the role of criminal justice reform uh, in making a more productive, just, equitable, global society. Uh, I, this is another one of those things besides uh, evasion and tax evasion that I've learned a lot about since I've written the book. I am in no way an expert on criminal justice reform, uh, but, but everything I've read and the people I've talked with suggest that this has very important implications uh, for, the, for people's economic mobility uh, and, and uh, uh, getting people out of the poverty 
trap. So uh, I think this is a friendly amendment, but I, I, didn't, I didn't write it up here more just this report. Question 10. All right. Okay, now we make the task of work progressive. Um, I think there's uh, a few ways to do that, uh, or several ways to do that. Uh, the most important thing to do is to close an enormous loophole with respect to capital gains. Uh, capital gain is the increase in the price of an asset from when you bought the asset to when you sold the asset. So if you buy it at 100, you sell it at 1,000, and that would pay money. Uh, what happens is uh, if people hold assets until they die, uh, the, like say, say someone bought the asset at 100, they sell it, they, they hold it until they die, which is worth 1,000. The, people, the person that inherits the asset gets it with the government assuming that the price of the asset is 1000 So that 900 in gain never gets taxed. Right? And that causes all sorts of problems in the tax system. It reduces revenue. It, it, it encourages people never to sell. Uh, and it's a tax benefit uh, that a journalist was called the angel of debt loophole. Uh, that, uh, that accrues in almost entirely to the top 1%. Uh, and so that, that needs to be changed. Uh, to, I think what we should do is, is simply tax capital gains at debt as if the person had sold the assets. Uh, so that's one thing. I think there are a number of things that the 2017 tax cut, uh, including the subsidy for businesses, the reduction in the top rate, uh, and so on that that could be uh, reversed, uh, and of course we can raise rates. Uh, all of those are kind of conventional answers. Uh, there are more aggressive ways to tax capital gains, and of course there's a wealth tax proposal out there now uh, that was a bit more than uh, Senator Sanders had made, uh, which would tax the the extremely rich uh, at at really significant rates. So there's lots of options out there. I think there's an emerging consensus that we need to raise taxes on buying and out households uh, because A, we need the money, B, they've done extremely well, C, their taxes have not gone up uh, as a share of income uh, the way you would expect in a progressive tax system uh, given how much their income has gone. So I think this is a really important uh, uh, point, a really important issue, and um, uh, if you're following the election uh, campaigns, then you'll see this issue show up in virtually everyone's uh, uh, proposals. All right, and our last question uh, that we have is number two. Two. How are value added tax work? Okay. Uh, value added tax is basically like a sales tax, uh, except it's collected in bits at every chain of the production, uh, rather than all at once at the retail sale level. Um, this is one of the big ways in which the G7 countries differ from the US. They have value added tax because they raise about 6% of GDP, which is almost the entire difference between their taxes and our taxes. Um, uh, so what happens is each firm uh, pays taxes on the inputs that it buys, and then it charges taxes on the, the output that it sells. And uh, what that does is it, the firm gets a credit for the tax that it paid. Uh, so in the net effect uh, is that there's a tax on value added, but the total value added is just equal to the retail sale um, price. So the, the, you might ask, well, why would you do a retail sales tax? And the answer is a very hard to enforce. It comes back to funding and evasion things. Uh, if you go to the store and buy something, the store knows it, but the government doesn't know it. 
And so uh, that's a recipe for the store not reporting uh, uh, the tax to the government. Uh, value added taxes have much less of that because uh, each firm knows the other firm is going to report to the government, so it has incentive uh, to report. So uh, evidence on how effective value added taxes are administratively uh, is seen in the fact that uh, over 160 countries uh, in the world have a value added tax. And this was a tax that only came into existence 50 years ago. Right, uh, and, uh, and so it spread like wildfire around the world, uh, but the U.S. is the only major country uh, that does not have a value added. All right. Uh, thank you so much for answering our questions today. Uh, do you have any last words that you want to tell the students here at Concord University? Uh, I just really appreciate that you all are interested in these issues, and uh, uh, I'm impressed by the quality of the questions. They suggest some careful thought, and that's basically what we need in this country is a lot of people with your generation giving us a lot of careful thought. All right, so everyone, let's thank Dr. Gale for hopping on this call with us today. All right, and you have a great day. All right, thank you. You too. Take care.